Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here in Washington, D.C. at the Royal Norwegian Embassy when we have, where we have John Michael uh, Sturdal, who is the Director General of the Royal of the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. Sir, thanks very much for joining us. You're welcome. You're obviously visiting here. Uh, there's the Norwegian American Defense Industry Council meeting. There was also Navy League. You're part of that delegation, but you're also going to be meeting with some of your counterparts in, in the Pentagon. And obviously, innovation, uh, there's a debate about what the American innovation agenda is going to look like, but there is 100% confidence that it will continue. Norway has always prided itself on being an inno a defense innovator, right? For a small country, it has an enormous number of very, very successful firms. From a Norwegian perspective, what are the keys to having, to fostering innovation, having an innovative industry? From your standpoint, what are the keys to that innovation? Well, in the Norwegian defense community, we have what we call the triangle model. And in one of the corners, we have the, the user, the armed forces. And that's very important because they provide the needs and also with a lot of good experience on how to use them from operations. In the other corner, we have industry. They provide uh, cost, what's possible to actually do. And in the last corner, we have research and development, the optimistic guys that would like to innovate all the time and come with all the special solutions. And then uh, when we sit together, all three, and when we are successful, you are able to work out uh, very successful solutions and technologies with a low development cost. And this has resulted in, for instance, the naval strike missile uh, ammunition for the armed forces of both Norway and the U.S. We have rocket motors for uh, the U.S. and Norway. We have satellites, small satellites, nano satellites, uh, and uh, a lot of other things. Also, uh, processing of satellite data uh, has been developed with the same model, and not but not least underwater technology, the uh, Hugin autonomous underwater vehicle, which is now operational in the Norwegian Navy and a lot of other navies, and also a civilian version. And uh, Hydroid uh, was bought by Kongsberg, and this is now using the same type of both model development and technology in the, in the Hydroid products. Uh, and, and the Remus obviously being you know, a very good example of the Remus line of vehicles. Yes. Uh, what do you think is... Um, what are some of the research and development priorities for you as you meet with your U.S. counterparts? Where do you want to be working more closely with the United States? What are the kind of programs you want to work more closely on? Well, uh, we have uh, in Norway now, we look into autonomous systems. Uh, we are very successful in the underwater with the, uh, the Hugin, as already mentioned. And now we would like to take the same technology on unmanned surface vehicles, uh, up in the air, uh, unmanned air vehicles and aut autonomous air vehicles. And uh, those three uh, areas, and also vehicles on land. So we would like to bring our thoughts together with the U.S. thoughts on that and see what we can achieve together. But of course, we know that the U.S. invests something like six times the amount of R&D money in the military than the total of Europe. So uh, we have to focus on niche areas. And I think that's also a very critical factor of success from, from our point of view in Norway. We cannot do the big things like aeroplanes, submarines, or, or, or big fighter ships. So we have to be in subsystems and in niche areas, and there we can contribute to both burden sharing and also increasing the leverage in the U.S. forces and other NATO allied forces. One of the concerns and one of the drivers of the U.S. third offset strategy was mm -hmm the proliferation of technology, that the very technology that we're now all benefiting from that allows us this unprecedented connectivity, uh, you know, you can, you can go to a store and buy a dongle, of, and fl you know, a FLIR dongle that will give you, you know, uncooled night vision optics, which is, which, is, uh, which is an amazing sort of proliferation of technology that's game changing. Mm. In this kind of a world, what are the keys to maintaining that technological advantage when there's this leveling that the very technologies we're benefiting from, you know, it's not the Cold War. Russia can now benefit from it, has industries that can produce it. China, same thing. It's not like there's that vast gap between what the Western world can do and the communist world. What are some of the keys of getting into these technology cycles to remain on that cutting edge with the advantage on our side rather than our potential adversaries? I think it's uh, speed is one key word. And another word is to be innovative in using this type of technology. And one example from our side is the small nanosatellite. It's six kilos. It's two of those up in space right now, delivering very useful results from maritime surveillance. There we used a lot of technologies from the um, mobile telephone industry 
and were able to put this together in a very small satellite and then develop the extra technology needed to give the, the results we, we wanted. And I think being innovative and creat creative when we put together these already developed uh, technologies is the way to stay ahead and also uh, work closely, as I said, with the user and, uh, and industry. And I think we have to improve our acquisition model in the defense sector in general because it's designed for the Cold War and we have to update it to the modern world. Is smallness an advantage for speed? Is the fact that there are fewer hands touching it allow you to move much more quickly than somebody who's much bigger? We like to believe that in Norway and we, we, we say that we talk to each other all the time and at all levels. So we have a saying that the master and the master uh, talk together. That means that uh, the person on the, on the floor talk to the PhD people and they work out solutions together. And we also have very close connection with the armed forces so we can do experiments in, in Norwegian waters or in Norwegian land or in Norwegian air very easily together with the armed forces and we see this as a as an advantage of being small we use real data in our development so we try to find solutions for the real world very early in the development phase what do you think the next generations of most interesting technology are as a technologist and as you look out 5 10 15 20 years where do you think the most exciting breakthroughs are going to take place well, in general, I think we are part of a digital revolution, and in the broadest sense, this will turn our um, the defense sector upside down. That's my belief. And we have just seen the beginning of this. So I see all kinds of things related to this, like artificial intelligence, the use of uh, big data in a number of ways. Uh, autonomy will come very soon, I think. Some places it's already there. So these three at least will be very important for the development of the uh, defense uh, sector in the future. Do you think then, um, from a military perspective, people are as ready for that revolution, <coughs> that turning upside down as they should be? Uh, I think in general, and I think you find that in all organizations, uh, as conservatism, you would like to do what you have always done. And when it comes to technology, uh, I think you can say it can contribute in two ways. One, it can improve systems that you already have. And that's easy because everyone would like a new toy uh, as long as it does not uh, include an operational change or a conceptual change. As soon as you come with something breakthrough uh, technology that changed the way of operations, the concepts of operation and so on, you will find um, yourself in a position to fight against traditions and uh, old beliefs and so on. And, and that's one of the important things for uh, us to succeed. And we have a lot of examples, I would say, on the civilian side of companies that has not succeeded in this transformation, mentioning Kodak, Nokia, and so on. And uh, it's important that our armed forces will not end up like uh, Kodak or Nokia. What's the right kind of incentive structure that's necessary to get military people to change their minds so that they don't end up being the Kodak and the Nokia? What kind of incentive structure do you need to change them to get them to be harnessed and tied to wanting change instead of being end up being passed? I think we have to focus on the effects, what the effect you have in the, in the target, so to speak. Uh, and if you look back in history, you will see that during uh, crisis and wars, innovation is very fast. And this is because the need is so obvious and you have to change in order to survive. And we have to create this type of urgency and need to change also in uh, times where there is no crisis and no wars. Sir, thanks very much for all your time and best of luck on your visit. Thank you very much. Thank you.